I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Randy Sheckman from uh, UC Berkeley, who is also an alum of uh, UCEAP who went to Edinburgh. Um, as, as I was getting to, to know Dr. Sheckman before the, before the meeting, I, I thought that we, and I mentioned that we probably have a couple of things in common. Uh, one, we have in common with um, everybody in the audience. We are all products of study abroad and that has had a huge impact on, on our respective lives. And then the second one is that um, I did, did work on yeast for my PhD in microbiology and um, did not go as far as he went with, uh, with, with, the, with the medium, but as a graduate student and jokingly, um, probably got my yeast to produce a lot more beer than, um, than, than his yeast did. But, um, it's, it's truly a great honor to have uh, a, a Nobel Prize recipient among us uh, as one of our alums and for him to be kind enough to, to, and excited to join us and to speak about his experience. Dr. Sheckman participated as an undergraduate at UCLA in the University of Edinburgh program from 1968 to 1969. He credits his year in Edinburgh as a key event in the development of his career aspirations as an academic scholar and teacher. Dr. Sheckman considered pursuing medical school as an undergraduate at the University of California, Los Angeles, but after spending his junior year um, in the lab at the University of Edinburgh, his path to graduate school uh, became set. He obtained a PhD in biochemistry at Stanford and then uh, has been a professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California at Berkeley for the past 39 years where he conducts research and, and teaches, he was telling me, a, a, a freshman seminar and a graduate course. He's also an adjunct professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the University of California, San Francisco, here. And in addition, he's an, an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. His lab at UC Berkeley studies membrane assembly, vehicular transport, and membrane fusion among organelles of the secretory pathway and we'll hear a little bit about that. But you can hear much more in his uh, acceptance lecture um, for the Nobel Prize, which, which I highly recommend. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great lecture. His work has earned him many prestigious prizes in science, including the Albert Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research in 2002, and the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2013. As I was thinking, uh, in preparing for this speech, a statistic occurred to me, um, and I just want to share it with the group for what it was, and it is that there is a straight positive and significant correlation if you look at UC campuses between the number of students going abroad on UC EAP and the number of Nobel Prize winners on that campus. The top standards are UC Berkeley, UCLA, and UC Santa Barbara each send one in five students on UC EAP, and they also happen to have quite a few Nobel Prize winner uh, recipients. Whether it's a cause-effect relationship, I leave th that for you to decide, but I just wanted to mention it to the group. So with this, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Dr. Randy Sheckman Schen and bring him to the podium. mementos from the past that I want to make sure I can get on here. Okay. Thank you very much, Jean -Vier. Uh, Xavier. I'm really appreciative of your generous remarks and especially for the opportunity to speak this evening. When I got the invitation to participate in this program, I was very excited because I'd had essentially no connection with the EAP since 1969 when I, when I returned to the U.S., other than the fact that I encouraged my daughter to uh, do the EAP program in Mexico when she was an undergraduate at Berkeley uh, about uh, 12 years ago. So I'm delighted to be back. And uh, my remarks are, uh, I would say, more general about the importance of the University of California, of which, of course, the EAP program was so crucial in my career. But I, I, I want to start by saying that I've spent virtually my entire life in the University of California, 
and it has meant everything uh, to my career. And so uh, it's uh, my gratitude to be able to come back and to address you and to emphasize once again what a gift we've all had <clears throat> in our educations in UC. Um, I'm almost a California kid. I grew up in Southern California. Um, my first interest in science came when I had a toy microscope that my parents gave me for my birthday when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And I remember in Orange County where I grew up that it was still pretty rural back then. There was a creek near our home and I went to collect a jar of pond scum <laughs> and I examined a drop of the scum on, on a glass slide in this toy microscope and the world was revealed to me. It was astonishing to see the complexity of life uh, that you couldn't see with the naked eye. I was captivated by this. I spent hours in my room as a budding nerd looking through this microscope. <laughs> I was so excited that one evening at the dinner table expressing my excitement, my father was, um, uh, think, thought I'd been carried away by a toy and that it couldn't possibly tell me much, it was after all just a toy, I took umbrage with his remarks and I decided to save my earnings. I used to mow lawns, babysit, uh, I delivered newspapers. I saved it in an envelope in the closet in my bedroom aiming to collect $100 to buy a student professional microscope. Unfortunately, my mother kept borrowing the money <laughs> to buy groceries and I could never get the money, so I, one Saturday after I finished mowing a neighbor's lawn, I bicycled to the police station and I told the duty officer that I was running away from home because my mother was stealing my money and I couldn't get my microscope. <laughs> they called my father in, there were some words behind a closed door, and that afternoon I learned one of the most valuable lessons of my life <clears throat> because my father then drove me to a pawn shop in Long Beach and that's the microscope right there that became my pride of uh, possession during my high school years. Now, uh, as I contemplated my future, uh, there was no doubt that I would go to college. Everyone in the family was expected to go to college, but there was no difference among colleges. I mean, you'd just go to college. Uh, but I wanted to go to an excellent university, one where I felt that I would have not only peers, but opportunities to explore the intellectual life of an academic. And I was thrilled to be admitted to UCLA. Now, some of you are my age. You, you may remember back then when you applied to the University of California if you had the course requirements and you had a sort of a minimum grade point average. It was automatic. There was no requirement for an SAT. There were no exceptional grades required or letters or anything like that. So nonetheless, I'm so proud of the University of California that I saved the letter <laughs> that I received when I was admitted by the then Chancellor Franklin D. Murphy in 1966 uh, to join the, the intellectual scholars of the University of California. I arrived um, with great excitement, um, but I was a middle class kid Nonetheless, as you recall, those of you who were, were around back then, it was virtually free. I think the fees in 1966 amounted to no more than $80 a term. I lived in a student co-op. My fees were $800 a year room and board. I could work a summer job and pay for the entire school year. Indeed, the, my four siblings all went to public institutions, public colleges and universities, my father never had to pay anything to send us to what were then the finest institutions in the country. In 1966, when I graduated from high school, California was near the top of the country in per capita expenditure on public education. And we all know now too well where that's gone. We in, of that generation had the benefit of the wise investment of Pat Brown, and the administration at that time in the tremendous growth of the UC system. The opportunity for working and middle class families to have a free education 
and to better their lives as a result of that exposure. Sadly, his son, our current governor, is not as supportive of the university as Pat Brown. So I tip my hat to the father, Pat Brown, and to the visionary leader of the University of California, Clark Kerr, who was instrumental in the creation of the master plan for higher education, which we still hold on to, though it's uh, sh fairly shredded with time. As you recall, uh, Clark Kerr was unceremoniously booted from his position by Ronald Reagan, who became the governor of California when I started UCLA in 1966. And Kerr likes to say that he both started and left the university fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> well, now I tell the story about my time at UCLA and the reasons that I went there, but there was another reason that I went there, and that was um, in, uh, when I was a senior in high school, this gentleman was recruited to play basketball <laughs> at the university. Now, how many of you know this fellow's name in 1966? Who knows this fellow's name in 1966? Lou Alcindor, yes. Lou Alcindor was the premier high school basketball player in the country. He was recruited by the great coach John Wooden to play at UCLA the year before I started. But back then, the freshmen who played basketball were not eligible to play varsity. So I had the opportunity then uh, to witness his first college games. Indeed, I waited outside of Pauley Pavilion, which was in 1966 brand, brand new. I waited outside all night to get season tickets to watch him play. I paid $6.25 for the entire season. <laughs> he was my, my hero during that time. I, of course, had no athletic aspirations. There was no question that I wouldn't play on the basketball team. But I became deeply interested in scholarship. And I had the opportunity in my freshman year to take some exceptional courses in chemistry. My first term chemistry professor, a man by the name of Kenneth Trueblood, who was a brilliant teacher, so inspiring that at the end of the term, he got a standing ovation from the class. How many of you have ever seen that? I did well, and I had the opportunity to uh, be in the honors section of chemistry, taught then by Willard Libby, a PhD from Berkeley who won the Nobel Prize uh, for his invention, his creation of carbon-14 radio dating. And that was quite an inspiration. But the most important aspect of that class in my freshman year was the opportunity to work in a research lab. Every student in the honors section was assigned to work with a professor in the chemistry department. And I was assigned to the laboratory of a brand new assistant professor who himself had graduated from Berkeley. Uh, and he said, well, the first thing that you have to do if you're serious about this business is read this new book that's just come out. It's called Molecular Biology of the Gene by James D. Watson, the famous uh, discoverer of the structure of DNA. That book was a revelation for me. It, it, uh, it expressed the beauty of life in molecular terms, in, 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 and it was as though I was reading the Bible. It was, uh, for me, a, a revelation. The, sub, the following year, he published his famous autobiography called The Double Helix, which many people found scandalous, but which I found pure, pure excitement. It was clear that uh, uh, I was not going to be going to medical school, much to the disappointment of my parents, but that I was going to be become a scholar, and it was really UCLA that offered me that opportunity. I had the opportunity then to join a research laboratory in my second year, and in the course of that year, I took a graduate course uh, and talked to a, one, of the, one of the professors about um, Edinburgh, because I had then decided that I was going to do my junior year abroad, and I'd, uh, I'd picked Edinburgh as a place to go. And uh, my professor indicated that there was a new medical research council unit that just started in Edinburgh. And I wrote away as I was admitted to the program and uh, was um, welcome to uh, join the, uh, that uh, department when I came to Edinburgh. Let me reflect a little bit more about uh, the importance of that particular year. Um, it was early years in the EAP program. I think it had only been in existence for a few years. Nonetheless, there were a few students who'd come back and we had a session. I remember the group of us at UCLA who were uh, accepted into the program. We had a session uh, discussing 
what to expect when we went abroad. Now, of course, I was, I was a Californian, so I had not experienced the weather uh, of, um, of Scotland. I was warned by one of the students uh, what to expect. He said one morning he woke up and the toilet was frozen and he had to chip the ice in the toilet in order to use it. I rented a room in a home on Mayfield Gardens in Edinburgh and uh, the room was one of these tall ceiling rooms that never properly heated up. There was a heater that was set into the fireplace of the room uh, but I only learned in the fall that the flue to the chimney was open all winter. <clears throat> so I plunked a lot of shillings into that meter and the room never warmed up. I learned instead to take my clothes into bed with me the night before under the covers uh, to stay warm while I put my clothes on and, and got out as quickly as I could. But the landlady was wonderful, the family was very warm. I learned to appreciate blood pudding and kippers for breakfast. Um, I haven't had that in many years. Um, those of us from that period may recall, I don't know if you had this experience, um, Ambassador Bondine, but those of us who went to Europe in uh, 1968, uh, the EAP program was fairly flush with money back then, and we, we had a free ride on an ocean liner, the USS United States. You didn't... You didn't get that to go to Hong Kong. Well, it's a bit longer through the Pacific, but... So all of us, uh, I don't know, was, was anybody, anybody benefit from that here this evening? Unfortunately, it's of course long since discontinued, but what a, what a memorable experience. What a, what a gift. We all gathered uh, in New York and uh, got on the USS United States and over three days were treated like royalty. And I'll never forget waiting up all night uh, as we saw the harbor of Le Havre uh, come closer to us as, uh, as the sun rose uh, in that fall day in 1968. I remember we met as a group in London and had um, a dinner together uh, and a discussion of an orientation and then we went our separate ways. I took a train to Edinburgh and met my uh, new landlord and um, had just a wonderful time taking the third year biochemistry course in the medical school downtown in Edinburgh and working in a laboratory. Now I mentioned earlier that I had introduced myself to the professor of the Medical Research Council unit in Edinburgh in anticipation of my going there, but they misinterpreted my letter and thought that I was coming as a sabbatical visitor. And I arrived to find that I'd been given, given my own laboratory <coughs> and my own office with my name on the door. <laughs> and um, they quickly realized the mistake they made. <laughs> but nonetheless, they were, they were very generous to me during that year. I had so many experiences that year that I, I, it just takes too long to describe. But one, one memorable one was uh, an evening devoted um, to Robbie Burns, the poet, the Robbie Burns annual celebration. Uh, my fellow students invited me to a dinner uh, where they were dressed up in kilts and uh, regalia and uh, here, was I, here I was this nerd American. So the first thing they did, of course, was to give me a book of poetry and ask me to read a Robbie Burns poem and uh, that was pretty embarrassing, um, especially when, a, when an authentic Scott took over and I couldn't understand what he was saying. He addressed the haggis. Those of you in Edinburgh may have had the opportunity, if you want to call it that, to eat haggis, I did, and actually quite enjoyed it. It was maybe even better than blood pudding. <laughs> I remember the Scottish pubs. I remember my travel to the continent during the two breaks of that year. But I also remember the trips to London, which in 1969 was a major location for anti-Vietnam War protests. I had the advantage of a Brit Rail pass. I went to London, and I may have even experienced that uh, protest line with Bill Clinton, who was there that year. Um, one difference that you may recall, those of you who traveled to, to Britain, indeed to the continent, unlike education in the University of California or generally in, in, the, uh, in the US, where you have frequent tests, in Britain, there's one comprehensive test at the end of the year. And that was very difficult and very traumatic for me, but I survived by the skin of my teeth. I came back to UCLA 
I finished my uh, undergraduate career uh, working again in a laboratory, and uh, I, having the experience I had in Edinburgh encouraged me to consider working with a brilliant scientist, perhaps the greatest biochemist of the second half of the 20th century, a man named Arthur Kornberg, who was a professor at Stanford University. And my uh, experience at UCLA, the opportunities that I had allowed me to gain admission to that department, which really was the best biochemistry department in the country, and then to work with Arthur and in fact, I saved that letter as well. This is my letter of admission to Stanford. I realize we shouldn't be promoting Stanford at an event like this, but it nonetheless was a, was a great experience. The training that I had at UCLA, the training that I had at Berkeley was followed by two years of postdoctoral work at UC San Diego. So you see, I really am a creature of the University of California. But really, the greatest gift that I had was when I had the call from my, my future colleagues at UC Berkeley to join them as a faculty member in 1976. So my wife and I, Nancy, traveled up the coast from San Diego and took up residence just north of Berkeley, and we've remained ever since. This is now my 40th year on the faculty. Let me just briefly, thank you. Let me just briefly tell you a little bit about what I did. Um, at, at, um, at San Diego, I took up an interest in biological membranes and how they may be put together and how that may be coordinated to how a cell grows and divides. Um, the work that preceded mine was pioneered by a, a brilliant cell biologist by the name of George Pilati, who won the Nobel Prize in 1974 for his work at the Rockefeller University in New York. I was inspired by what he did uh, and decided to pursue what he did at a cellular and descriptive level by trying to discover the genes and proteins that organize the process of protein export from cells. So almost all the cells in our body manufacture thousands of proteins, but some of them, and some that you know about, some that are working right now as you've eaten dinner, like insulin, are made inside the cell and yet have to be exported outside of the cell. And there's an elaborate process that organizes the conveyance of molecules like insulin or hormones or antibodies that are manufactured inside of the cell to the cell exterior. And so what I decided to do with my students at Berkeley was to explore this pathway, this process, in baker's yeast. Everyone before me had worked on mammals, on complicated tissues that were not amenable to genetic or biochemical techniques. But yeast is a simple organism. It can grow, be grown in the laboratory. Here's a cluster of yeast cells, such as you might see on the surface of a grape. And they grow and add cell surface and export proteins, it turns out, almost exactly as the cells in our body do. So I had some brilliant students, and we set about to look for the genes required for this process. And in so doing, we had to kill a lot of yeast cells. And of course, that being Berkeley, any time you propose to do something like kill a living being, you're subject to protests. We too were subject, subject to such protests. <laughs> and the torture in the labs. Yeast have feelings too. We were able to persuade the experimental animal subject committee that yeast are, in fact, not sentient beings and we have since killed literally trillions of yeast cells. <laughs> well, this, this went fairly well. I'm skipping over hmm, 38 years. It went very well. Uh, the, I credit the, the brilliant students that are attracted to Berkeley and to the University of California for much of the success of my laboratory. And uh, my life changed almost two years ago when I got a call at 1.20 in the morning from Stockholm um, awarding me the Nobel Prize. Um, there were two months of hectic preparation. Uh, we got all dressed up, as you see here. My children, uh, my son, Joel, my daughter, Lauren, my wife, Nancy, who is here with me tonight, looking uh, better than we normally do, <laughs> in advance of a ceremony that can only be described as an uh, almost religious experience, where you uh, meet the king and queen, and you're greeted. 
I've watched this ceremony before on uh, YouTube, and I've often marveled at the King of Sweden, who seemed to be saying something to each candidate, each awardee, as they come up to receive the diploma. But I can tell you now what he actually said. As I uh, strode up to shake his hand, the first words out of his mouth were, now I'm going to give you your diploma, <laughs> and now I'm going to shake your hand. <laughs> so I want to finish with two things that have come full circle in my life and my career. The first was that, that microscope that I told you about that was so important that I extorted from my parents. Uh, my children were not interested in science, um, but my parents sent the microscope up to us when we moved to our home near Berkeley, and it sat and collected dust for many, many years. Uh, then, uh, shortly after the announcement of the Nobel Prize, I received an email from Stockholm from something called the Nobel Museum. And they, each year, they ask the laureates to send them some artifact from the past. So I dusted off my microscope, and I wrapped it up and FedExed it to them. And if you ever happen to be in Stockholm, you can visit my microscope here, <laughs> together with a docent tour that tells, will tell the story about how I ran away from home to get this. <laughs> Last year, in uh, an experience that can only be described as surreal, I was invited back to UCLA to give the major commencement address at the College of Letters and Science in that wonderful Pauley Pavilion, where I had waited outside all night to get season tickets to the basketball game. Uh, the auditorium was filled to capacity with 20,000 people, students, parents, many of them screaming, not for me, but rather for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, <laughs> who introduced me <laughs> as the commencement speaker that year. So I, th I don't think it's too hard to imagine that I feel I've had a, that I've been blessed, and I credit much of that to the University of California. Thank you.